uh, we'll do an intro to Mars. Um, for those of you that don't have a lot of uh, a lot of background in that, when I started graduate school, I had zero background in that. I knew it was a red planet. So we'll do a little bit of background into that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about past Mars, mis Mars missions. And then I'm going to delve uh, more into the particular mission that I work on, which is the Mars Science Laboratory or Curiosity Rover mission. Um, and uh, more about the work I do uh, specifically for that mission, which of course involves using minerals to address some of the outstanding questions related to Mars's geologic history. Um, and at the end, I'll briefly outline a few uh, data science projects I'm working on that relate to Mars research. All right, I think everyone can see my slides. Someone stop me if you can't for any reason. Um, so first, let's start by talking about why Mars and why we want to study it rather than, say, focusing on all of our time on our planet and the many problems and questions that we have here. Um, firstly, it's the closest, well, firstly, it's it's very cool and it's exciting, right? Okay. Um, but the, the other firstly um, is that it's the closest potentially habitable planet near us and one of the most likely candidates to have once hosted life. Okay, it had water, it had the necessary chemical components, so that's schnapps, it's uh, sulfur, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus, um, and it had geologic cycling, uh, which are some of the key elements of habitability and likely the origin of life. So if we want to understand more about the origin of life, this is a very great um, testing ground for us to um, look at that. Um, so secondly, due uh, to having some notable similarities to Earth, um, including its overall composition, its size, its proximity to the sun, Mars is an analog of early Earth. So we can study Mars actually to better understand what happened on our home planet billions of years ago before plate tectonics, and more importantly, um, this very extensive overprinting of life uh, that completely changed the way our planet looks and behaves. I often get asked um, different questions about Mars. So here are some quick facts. Um, a day on Mars is called a sol, and uh, it's about the length of a day on Earth, but it's just 37 minutes longer. So this doesn't seem like a lot, but if any of you have worked on a mission, um, you know it can make quite a difference. It means that one day I'm starting at 8 a.m., the next day it's 8.37, and then it's nine something. Um, and before you know it, your day is starting at 11 p.m. and then 3 a.m. And so the small amounts of time uh, make a pretty big difference in schedule. You're really moving around the clock. Um, so we did that only for the first 90 days. Um, but it was pretty intense. Um, so a Mars year is about twice as long as a year on Earth. Uh, there are some pretty big temperature swings, um, but it can actually get reasonably warm during the summer near the equator up to 80 F, um, which would be quite nice. Um, the Mars atmosphere is 95% CO2, so pretty different from ours. Um, but it's also significantly thinner than Earth's atmosphere. It has less than point uh, or less than one percent of our atmospheric density. So Mars atmosphere wasn't always this way. Um, it likely had uh, more of an atmosphere before it lost its magnetic field. Um, and so it likely in the past had more protection uh, from the sun's harmful radiation and, and likely prevented water from evaporating and being lost to space like it is today. Um, Mars is about half the diameter of Earth and it has one third of our gravity. So um, the Mars Exploration Program with NASA, there are obviously a lot of other space agencies that are in the game as well, but um, I'm most familiar with NASA, so I'm going to talk about that. Um, so currently there are four primary focus areas in terms of Mars research and exploration. The first is life, um, with the goal to better understand whether or not Mars ever supported life. And um, the second is climate, with the aim to characterize the climate history on Mars and the associated environments and processes. The third is uh, geology with the goal to study and better understand the planetary evolution and geologic history of Mars and the processes that shaped it through deep time. And lastly, humans. We wanna understand how can we best prepare for human exploration, which requires a good understanding of the terrain, the climate, the composition, and the, certainly the levels of radiation on the surface, which is something we've been um, monitoring for a long time. So um, I think it's so cool looking at, at what's gone on over the past 60 years. So I'm just going to touch on a couple uh, missions. So Mars exploration began um, almost 60 years ago with the Mariner flyby mission uh, launched in 1964. It captured the first up-close photographs of the Martian surface. And prior to these images, scientists really didn't know 
um, what Mars was actually like. Uh, so finding geologic signs um, that, you know, based on the surface morphology that water may have flowed on the planet's surface really changed the way researchers viewed Mars. It was now a candidate for having hosted life. Um, but of course, at this time, they had no idea that we would find such rich geologic and aqueous history on the planet. The first landed missions were Viking 1 and 2 in the 1970s, and they provided the first photographs taken actually from the surface of Mars, as well as the first chemical analyses of Martian soil. Um, there are some interesting experiments that were done there, and there's some controversy around that we can talk about if you'd like, but there's a very cool history there. Um, but ultimately, these missions observed frost um, or ice on the ground during the winter, ultimately thought to be primarily CO2 ice, possibly some water ice. And they showed that Mars was a significantly more chemically interesting and diverse place than we'd originally suspected. The first rover uh, Sojourner um, came in the mid-1990s as a part of the Pathfinder mission, which included landing a base station from which the rover uh, could explore. This mission observed uh, rounded pebbles and cobbles, which here on Earth are formed as the result of moving water. So you would find this in like a river or, you know, a, a lake front or ocean front where you're having water movement. Um, and so that suggested that during wetter, warmer times in Mars's history, there may have been running water. So um, from this time onward, there were a string of orbiters and landers, uh, as well as the Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, which launched in 2003. These twin geologists uh, lasted much longer than anyone imagined they would. Um, so I'm, I don't know if that's popping up for you guys or not. Hopefully not. Maybe it is. Oh, well, it's okay. We're going to keep going. Um, so... Okay, good. I was, it's like the people popping up where I come, but I, it's small. It's fine. Um, so where was it? Spirit and Opportunity. So Spirit um, explored Gusev Crater for over six years. Um, so very long time. Their prime mission was six months. So a lot longer. Um, and Opportunity explored Meridiani Planum and the craters around it for more than 14 years until a global dust storm in 2018 likely covered the solar panels causing hibernation and loss of contact. And, and they were never able to regain contact with Curiosity. Um, and uh, uh, not Curiosity. Huh. Opportunity. Um, that was, it was sad, of course, um, but both Spirit and Opportunity had amazing runs and they made a lot of scientific discoveries, including detecting many minerals um, like clays and gypsum that indicate long-standing presence of liquid water and possibly habitable environments. Um, so speaking of dust, uh, these are images uh, captured by Spirit. I think they're really, really cool, um, but they also demonstrate just how much of a role wind plays in moving uh, material around the planet and uh, in shaping the surface features. So here, um, we can actually see that dust storm uh, that caused uh, us to lose contact with opportunity. Um, these, these winds uh, that you are seeing can result in global dust storms. This has happened many times um, throughout Mars' history, and these storms can completely obscure the Martian surface. And as I mentioned earlier, they can block rover solar panels, and it can cause um, communication to be lost, essentially, and the inability to, um, to charge. Um, so during the dust storm, uh, Curiosity, it doesn't use solar panels, but we actually lost communication. We were unable to communicate with our rover as well. Um, we didn't have any power issues, but we did have to shut down the mission um, until the dust cleared so that we could actually communicate with the rover. So this, of course, brings me to Curiosity um, and the Mars Science uh, Laboratory mission. Um, I'll talk more about the mission in a few minutes, but for now, I'll just say that Curiosity was the largest rover ever sent to another planetary body. Uh, it weighs a ton and is about the size of a Mini Cooper. So you can see me here with the testbed rover for scale. This was a few years ago. Uh -huh. The rover has been, I think we're, we're 10... 10 years on this year, I think. So um, August, I think is 10 years. So um, this was a little while ago. Um, but yeah, so it was the, it was the largest rover uh, that's ever sent with the most advanced uh, scientific payload um, to date. And rather than having solar panels uh, for spacecraft power, uh, we have a nuclear battery. So we can lose communication in a dust storm, but we don't have to worry about losing power um, due to uh, the sun being blocked. So a newer, really neat mission uh, to Mars is the InSight lander. This landed uh, on the surface in late 2018. Uh, and this mission is really unique, uh, especially because it has a seismometer uh, used to detect any seismic activity, as well as a temperature gauge that will go relatively deep into the subsurface. 
Um, and this mission seeks to uncover how Mars formed and evolved by investigating the interior structure and composition. Um, so it will determine the rate of Martian tectonic activity and meteorite impacts. Mars has long been thought of as a tectonically inactive planet, um, but in the first year of this mission alone, InSight detected over 450 seismic events, most of which were consistent with some sort of tectonic activity, potentially even some type of plate movement, um, according to the, the scientists working on this, rather than meteorite impacts. So this was like, wow. Um, and they also discovered that Mars magnetic field was actually 10 times stronger than what was previously thought. It's still weak, but it's still there right? There's still more than we thought. So this mission is, is certainly changing the way that we think about the interior of Mars. And that's true of all of these missions. It's like with each one, we, we discover new things. Mars keeps surprising us. Um, which brings me uh, to the most recent NASA mission uh, to Mars. And uh, that's Mars 2020 uh, with the Perseverance rover, which landed in Jezero Crater uh, February of last year. So almost exactly a year ago. Um, Jezero Crater is an ancient deltaic fan where water likely flowed out onto the floor of the crater. Uh, and they think that this is an environment particularly hospitable for microbial life. And so that's why they've chosen uh, this as the landing site. Uh, Perseverance is based on the technology built for Curiosity. So it's about the same size and weight, but it has a slightly different um, scientific payload and it has a pretty notable difference in goals, which is that this mission is the first step in preparing for sample return from Mars, which is so exciting. Um, there's still a lot of scientific instruments, um, but there's also a sample caching system in which the rover will drill rock cores, put them in a small tube to preserve them, and place them on the surface to be picked up uh, for sample return, hopefully by 2031. So this is a really exciting step uh, towards, towards you know, getting samples back from Mars. So <clears throat> now that we've got to talk about the cool uh, NASA history on Mars there, let's talk a little bit about uh, the MSL mission and how we explore Mars and some of our findings. So our, our primary scientific goal is to explore and quantitatively assess uh, a local region on Mars surface uh, as potentially a habitat for life either past or present and to characterize the geologic history of this area. Curiosity has 17 cameras and 10 scientific instruments. So I told you there's a lot going on. Um, of course, there's the, the Kemen instrument, which you're gonna hear me talk about a lot. And that's here inside the body of the rover. Kemen stands for chemistry and mineralogy, and it's an X-ray diffraction instrument. And so we use that to definitively detect and analyze mineral species. Here you can see a map of the locations of the landed missions I mentioned earlier with um, many of them, including MSL, uh, concentrated around the equator uh, at the more temperate regions. So we're located inside Gale Crater, which is home to Aeolus Mons. This is referred to as uh, Mount Sharp, colloquially. Um, Mount Sharp is a five kilometer high mound of sedimentary rock laid down over billions of years of Martian geologic history. And therefore these layers of rock give us an opportunity to sample a huge swath of geologic environments that were deposited over time. So as we're driving up this mountain, we're actually driving up uh, through time. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, an important piece of understanding the geologic history of a sample or a crater or a planet is understanding its mineralogy and the composition of those minerals, because they can give us a lot of important information about their formational conditions, subsequent weathering and alteration, and even um, evidence for habitability. So to give you an idea uh, of the scale of the terrain we're covering, you can see the lower reaches of Mount Sharp on the left, and that tiny boulder circled here is about the size of the rover, so we've had to surmount um, some pretty serious terrain, uh, which we've mostly done without too many problems. Um, we've traveled quite a distance, uh, 16 miles approximately. It was actually 16.8 miles as of uh, today when I checked. And uh, we sampled many, many sites along the various, uh, along the way with our various scientific instruments. So most of the material we're dealing with is sediment. So that's in the form of sand dunes, such as the gorgeous Namib dunes you see here. I find these pictures to just be breathtaking. I, mean, I just imagine standing there and looking at that, just like, um, but they're also sedimentary rocks, um, and so these include a few sandstones uh, that were once part of a delta, things that we see at the Kimberley Formation here. Um, we also found a conglomerate, which contains those rounded pebbles I mentioned earlier and represents a potential uh, fluvial or river deposit, and a lot of mudstones, which were deposited in lacustrian or lake environments. 
Kemen has sampled over 36 rock and soil samples so far, 28 of which were uh, fluvial lacustrine in nature. And uh, we sample in two ways. One is by scooping up loose sediment, as you can see here on the left. And the other is by drilling uh, rock and scooping up the drill finds, which you can see what that looks like there on the right. Once we've scooped up the material, we can use the rover's arm to deliver it to the Kemen instrument inside the body of the rover. We only need a small amount of sample, so it's about the amount of a baby aspirin you can see there uh, in the video. It's just a really tiny bit. Uh, we pour the sample material into one of our 27 reusable sample cells, and we move the sample wheel such that the cell is positioned um, between our x-ray source and our uh, detector. So then we shoot the rock material with our x-ray beam and the x-rays hit the mineral grains, bounce off in a specific way. You guys probably know exactly what that is and that bouncing off is called diffraction. Each mineral has a unique x-ray diffraction pattern which we record with our detector. Our sample cell is vibrating and it's moving the material around while we analyze it so that the beam will hit the many mineral phases uh, in each sample and it'll do so at all different angles. So we're kind of getting around some of the sample prep and, and kind of heavy duty machinery that we use on Earth, um, that's how we get around it on Mars is by vibrating that sample cell. And so you can see the two, uh, you can see the diffraction, the diffracted x-rays hitting our detector here and resulting in a two-dimensional x-ray diffraction pattern of our multi-mineral sample. So this is what um, the XRD pattern looks like. We convert that 2D pattern um, on the left to the 1D pattern on the right, which is probably what's most familiar um, to all of you. Um, each mineral has a unique pattern, like a fingerprint, and it allows us to determine uh, what it is. And with some detailed calibration of the instrument that I performed uh, post-landing, we're also able to tell very precisely what the chemical composition is of that mineral species. Additionally, we're also able to determine uh, the abundance of each mineral in a sample. So I know how much of each mineral is, is present, um, what type it is, and what composition it is. So all of those things can be very telling of the geologic conditions. Okay, this is a mineralogy club. Everyone knows the answer to that question. I really don't need to say this, but I still just wanted to, there's some ambiguity around this. So I thought that I would just very clearly say what I mean when I say mineral. Um, and we can argue about whether or not it can be organic or not after. Um, so my definition of a mineral is that it is a naturally occurring solid um, with a well-defined chemical composition, like the olivine and member you see here, forsterite, which is a magnesium silicate, and a well-defined crystal structure, which is the arrangement of atoms that is repeated over and over again uh, to form a crystal. So these two characteristics um, are entirely determined by the chemical, physical, geological, and sometimes biological environment in which they form. And what this means is that if we know the chemistry and we know the structure, we can reverse the problem and determine the formational environment, which is really useful when we're trying to characterize the geologic history and habitability of another planet. The fact is on Mars and, and on Earth, any, anywhere, um, any planetary body, the oldest samples that we have are minerals. And so if we can understand the ways in which those minerals formed and the things that happened to them after they formed, we can tell the history of that planet. So. What minerals did we find on Mars? There's a lot going on on this diagram. You do not need to, to it, take this all in at once. I'm gonna break it down. Um, so what have we found in Gale Crater? Um, we have found a lot of minerals. So on the left on this diagram, you'll see our, our strat column here. Um, so this is the, the stratigraphic section um, of Gale Crater. So we started at the lowest point. Um, at, at Yellowknife Bay, at the Bradbury uh, group, and then we move up all the way into the Pontors member, which is what we were sampling um, in, very recently uh, in the fall. Um, and then here you see all the fluvial lacustrine samples that have been analyzed by Kemen up until our most, uh, the most recent um, Pontors member that we were studying. We're, we're analyzing some new samples right now, um, but we're not quite finished with those analyses. And um, let's just isolate to make it a little bit easier to look at. Let's isolate um, the igneous minerals. Um, so you'll notice that all of the samples contain a significant amount of feldspar, particularly plagioclase, uh, in all but one sample, um, which was a sandstone at the Kimberley Formation. That sample had more abundant alkali feldspar, um, but generally plagioclase is the most abundant phase throughout all of the samples. There's no discernible trend in the feldspar content upsection. However, if we look at the mafic silicates, uh, olivine and pyroxene, we see that we only detected olivine in the lower um, stratigraphic regions, and we also see a general decrease in pyroxene as we move up section. So this is telling us 
Those of you who are, have taken petrology and are familiar with Bowen's reaction series, this is telling us that the lower rocks are less altered or less evolved. In this case, it's more likely that they're less altered. Um, and, uh, and we're seeing more alteration as we move up section. Um, so another interesting feature in the, is the silicication we observed in the Stimson formation. So you can see that the two samples uh, here with the, with the containing these blue uh, silica polymorphs, cristobalite and tritomite, um, they, cristobalite is not uncommon in, in mafic igneous rocks, but tritomite was pretty unexpected, particularly in such high concentrations. Uh, it's still a source of investigation and, and speculation. There are a couple papers um, that have come out recently, so please um, feel free to, to check them out. Um, but yeah, we don't exactly know what's going on there. Generally on Earth, uh, tritomite is associated with thalsic volcanism. So to find it on a basaltic planet was puzzling, but you know, Mars keeps throwing things at us that we, that, you know, that surprise us. Um, so some people think that it's the result of a hydrothermal processes or acid sulfate alteration, but that is still um, an open question. So definitely check out some of those papers. Um, so now if we isolate and blow up um, the iron oxides, we have observed magnetite and hematite, both of which are associated with several different geologic environments, um, including basaltic volcanism and various types of alteration, but with hematite being associated with more oxidizing conditions. So we also observed uh, the less common acaganeite uh, in a few samples. This phase is usually indicative of acid saline fluids, um, but you can see uh, in the lower stratigraphic section, uh, we see a lot of magnetite and only a small amount of hematite. But as we move up section, we see hematite largely becomes the dominant iron oxide phase, indicating that we're seeing more oxidized conditions in the upper regions, which is exactly the trend we saw in the, in the silicates. So we can note um, some sulfates and carbonates. Specifically, we observed um, evaporates, uh, gypsum, bastite, and hydrite commonly throughout the section uh, with a notably higher concentration uh, in the Murray Formation, the upper Murray Formation. Uh, these are generally found in veins running through the samples. And you'll notice that there's a bit of jerosite here in pink, that bright pink color. Uh, jerosite is associated with acid sulfate alteration. There's a little bit of iron carbonate in the upper part of the strat column. Uh, and these are associated with near neutral sulfur poor fluids. So now if we come back to this diagram of the overall mineralogy, you'll notice that most of the samples, except for the two silicified samples in the Stimson formation, contain phyllosilicates or clay minerals uh, shown in purple. We were just discussing before we got this talk started how important those phyllosilicates are. Um, phyllosilicates have a sheet structure. So think sheets of paper stacked and loosely held together by van der Waals forces. They are very complex materials and they're associated with secondary alteration and weathering. So that's pretty important. That's what we're trying to figure out on Mars. So they can tell us a lot of information if we can identify the phase and the atoms that reside between those layers. So you can get organic molecules, you can get you know, big cations and all sorts of things in between these layers. So, um, but basically the problem with clays is they give us a lot more, a lot less to go on crystallographically than the more crystalline phases. Um, specifically, we have to examine a single XRD peak position, which is essentially a measure of that inner layer spacing, uh, rather than using the whole crystal structure um, or unit cell. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so there's a lot of work that's been done here, but I'm not the expert on the team. I'm not a clay mineralogist. So um, for the sake of time, I won't, I won't go into that too much, but um, I'll summarize by saying that the clays we've observed are associated with weathering by longstanding bodies of water with a range of pH from neutral to more acidic. And the last phase I'd like to point out, you might not have even noticed because of the way I have the diagram colored, um, but it's the X-ray amorphous material and that's the material that's listed in white. So it's a constant presence in all of our samples and can be as high as 70 weight percent of the analyzed sample. Um, this material is particularly hard to study because not only uh, can you not isolate it from the sample to measure its chemistry, but it doesn't diffract X-rays. Um, this lack of diffraction can be caused by two things. Uh, it can be one, that the grains are simply too small to have large enough planes off of which uh, the X-rays can diffract. So it is crystalline, but it's just too small. Um, <clears throat> and the second is that the material can actually be truly amorphous. Um, so it lacks the long range repeated order entirely. And that would be for some, you know, something like a glass um, if we're thinking about structure. So studying these phases is 
really difficult. You thought clays were hard. This is really difficult. Um, but they're, they're really important and they make up a significant amount of the material present in each of the samples. And they're likely the product of weathering, alteration and degradation through deep time. So we wanna know what's going on. Um, so while we can't directly measure the amorphous uh, component chemistry, we can do some back calculation based on bulk, com uh, bulk composition mixing up composition and chemistry. Um, and uh, we can do, so we can do these back, back calculations with bulk composition and crystalline composition to determine what is the, the overall composition of the amorphous component. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, towards the end, but let's come back to this chemical composition of crystalline phases. Uh, on Earth, we determine the chemical composition of minerals with very large and very expensive uh, analytical equipment, things like microprobes and mass specs. However, none of these instruments exist in small enough forms to fly on spacecraft. So, um, and also, in, perhaps more importantly, these techniques require the isolation of an individual mineral phase of interest, whether that you need to get a single grain or you need to just isolate out all of the grains of olivine. Um, that's really, really hard to do uh, on another planet. Um, so if I want to know the composition of my olivine, uh, you know, there's no way for me to just pull all of the olivine out of a sample uh, on Mars. Um, it's hard enough to do it in a laboratory, but it's really impossible to do it, you know, with a robot geologist on another planet. So, um, so basically what I did is I pushed our XRD instrument farther um, than simple mineral phase identification. Uh, we can actually estimate the chemical composition of individual mineral phases with the X-ray diffraction pattern. So let's come back to our olivine sample. Forced right has uh, an ideal composition of two magnesium atoms, one silicon atom and four oxygen atoms. But in reality, there are other elements mixed in. Most commonly for olivine, the other element is iron. So the iron version of olivine is called phthalite. But again, in nature, we rarely see an olivine crystal that is all iron or all magnesium. And what we actually see is a mixture of the two, which can tell us information about the formational temperature and the composition of the magma from which it formed. So let's take a look at how we do that. Here we have the crystal structure of magnesium olivine. The uh, green atoms are magnesium, the blue are silicon, and the red are oxygen. A mineral's crystal structure is defined by its unit cell, which is the gray box uh, you're seeing there, and it's the crystallographic unit that repeats over and over again in space to form this regular repeating crystal structure or translational periodicity, if you will. This unit cell is defined by its dimensions, the links, uh, the length of the edges, so that's A, B, C, and the angles between those edges, alpha, beta, gamma, in this case, they're all 90 degrees. Um, but you can see that the forced right structure, uh, magnesium is pretty small. So here we're looking at these green guys. It's pretty small, but when we add iron to the crystal structure, look at what happens. So the entire structure becomes larger because iron is a larger atom. It's quite a bit larger than magnesium. So it turns out that as you add more and more iron to olivine, the crystal structure changes in a very regular systematic way. So by mining a lot of experimental data from laboratory measurements, I can statistically characterize the relationships between the unit cell dimensions and the amount of iron. What this means is that when I get x-ray diffraction data from Kemen, I can accurately predict the amount of iron and magnesium that is present in that olivine on Mars. And I can also do this for many other um, mineral phases as well, not just olivine. So here, here is that very systematic relationship uh, that I mentioned between the unit cell parameters and the iron and magnesium content in olivine. This is a graphical representation of that. So each one of these data points um, is a laboratory measurement. All of these data are available um, on the Rough project web website. So uh, rough.info forward slash IMA, you can find it there. Um, and I'll have the link at the end, but of course, if anyone needs any links, feel free to, um, feel free to email me. Um, so on the x-axis of each of these graphs, we have the unit cell parameters. So we have A, B, C, and volume. And on the y-axis, we have the magnesium content in atoms per formula unit, or APFU. So if you recall, there are um, up to two magnesium or iron atoms in the chemical formula. So um, magnesium atoms per formula unit can range from uh, zero, which would indicate 100% iron, 0% magnesium, um, or up to two magnesium, which would indicate 100% magnesium and 0% uh, iron. So this is just the, the unit convention that we use. Um, 
So given the nearly spherical strain ellipsoid of the olivine crystal structure, so it's kind of equidistant when you, it, it expands all kind of in the same, uh, the same manner in every direction, um, we can use any one of these unit cell parameters to uh, estimate this, uh, this relationship between chemical composition and structure for Martian olivine. But the B unit cell parameter had slightly higher variance. Um, so we were able, it was a little bit more sensitive to magnesium and iron. So it gives us a slightly better estimate and that's the one that we use. So with this simple linear equation, we can um, use the B unit cell parameter to predict the amount of magnesium. And then of course, we just calculate iron by difference. To illustrate the accuracy, here's a plot of the calculated magnesium content versus the observed. And you can see that um, the error, the root mean squared error is 0.02 atoms per formula unit, which is pretty good. I mean, that's a pretty straight line. Um, so we computed those errors uh, with five-fold cross-validation. So we split the data randomly into training and testing. So 80% training, 20% testing, and we iterated the equation a thousand times. So each time you show, uh, each time you see a root mean squared error from now on, um, we use that same cross-validation technique. So um, here are the compositions of the olivine uh, that we analyzed in Gale Crater. The two uh, scoop soil samples, rock nest and gobabeb, had very similar compositions, which are much lower in magnesium uh, than the drilled sandstone uh, wingina, which is from that Kimberley formation I mentioned earlier. Um, overall, the uh, Gale olivine contains more iron than what we generally observe on Earth, which tells us uh, one of two things, either the Martian olivine crystallized at lower temperature uh, than what we generally see on Earth, or that the magma it crystallized from had a significantly higher iron component than what we generally have on Earth. Here we see the composition, uh, compositional distribution of Martian meteorites in blue uh, with the range of chemin samples in red. You'll note that there's a bimodal distribution um, of high and low magnesium olivines in uh, the meteorites uh, and that the chemin samples trend on the lower end of the high magnesium uh, meteorite olivine. Next, uh, let's look at a more complicated system. So this is the, the triclinic uh, plagioclase, or triclinic and, and monoclinic uh, plagioclase system. So you can see the relationship um, between calcium and their unit cell parameters. So this is a calcium sodium system. Uh, given the increased complexity uh, of this triclinic system, uh, the nonlinearity of these trends, a multivariate approach better estimates the chemical composition of, of plagioclase. Here you see a multivariate expression of A, B, C, beta, and gamma. Um, we got the best results with that. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, we're assuming a two-component system here. So we can use this equation to predict calcium, and then we calculate uh, sodium by difference. The calculated versus observed um, calcium content agrees very well um, with about the same error value as we had in the olivine system, which is pretty great. Um, I'm showing some, but not all, um, of the Gale Crater plagioclase compositions here. There were there are a lot of them. Um, uh, so, but you'll see it's not a huge range from about 0.3 uh, calcium to about 0.6 calcium, with an average of 0.42. Um, the windblown sediment, rock nest, and gobabeb tend to have a slightly higher calcium content than the other samples. And I compared uh, the range of Gale Crater plagioclase to that of Martian meteorites and found that it pretty much spans, uh, spans what we see in the Martian meteorites uh, distribution. So um, let's move on now to a even more complicated system, the magnesium iron calcium pyroxenes. Adding a third chemical component makes this less straightforward, and we could still use a least squares regression approach like we did in the previous two examples, but it's best if we actually treat this as an optimization or a minimization problem. There are a lot of plots here. You don't need to, to look at each one of them um, in great detail, but we're essentially looking at um, magnesium, iron, and calcium versus their unit cell parameters um, in the pigeonite system. So I don't expect you, so there we've we found three types of pyroxene, augite, pigeonite, and orthopyroxene. So for the example, I'm just going to show you pigeonite. Um, but so I don't, I don't expect you to read all this, but I wanted to show them simply to illustrate that the crystallographic and chemical complexity has increased relative to the mineral systems that we were looking at before. So you can see some of the trends, um, but most of the trends um, are in higher dimensions and therefore they're not apparent in these X, Y plots. So how did I tackle this problem? Um, as I said, this is best treated as an optimization routine. And the first step of which is doing um, a least squares regression of 
each of the unit cell parameters as a function of magnesium and calcium composition. The functional form I started with was that of Turnock et al.'s paper in 1973, in which they did a really nice job of characterizing um, the, the chemical and unit cell parameter space uh, with synthetic pyroxenes. Next, I tested every permutation of uh, Turnox equations in order to find the best fit for each of the unit cell parameters and found that none of the unit cell edges required all of the terms in Turnox equations. So we could um, simplify that a little bit. So here we're looking at the results for augite, um, the or excuse me, for pigeonite. Uh, the results for augite are very similar and orthopyroxene is, is a little bit simpler because it's, it's orthorhombic, um, but pretty similar. And so the next step then is to minimize the equation. So we want to find the smallest weighted sum of squared error of the observed unit cell parameters versus the calculated unit cell parameters. And the chemistry that minimizes that error is our optimal solution. Um, and I promise I'm almost done talking about math. Um, very close. So, so it turns out our equations work really, really well. Um, our error is about doubled from what it was in the simpler two component system. So here we have around you know, 0 0.04, 0 0.05 atoms per formula unit um, on, uh, for the error of, of each of those, but, but it's still really good. So we were quite pleased with these results. Um, so now let's uh, compare the Gale uh, pyroxene compositions to those of Martian meteorites. We have, um, of course, the classic pyroxene quadrilateral for those of you who have taken petrology. Um, for those of us who haven't, we're simply looking at a ternary or three component diagram. Um, so this is a way to display three dimensional compositional space, essentially, that's all it is. Um, so in this diagram, as you move up the diagram, you increase in calcium. As you move to the left, you increase in magnesium. And as you move to the right, you increase in iron. Um, so the, the point you plot on there can tell you how much you have of each of those three components. So the gray circles here represent Martian meteorite compositions, whereas the colored symbols represent uh, Gale crater pyroxenes. So the Gale samples uh, largely coincide with meteorite compositions. The augite triangles plot nicely within the augite range. The pigeonite uh, represented by squares is uh, largely within the range of Martian meteorites. Although the altered sandstone Lubango, which is that light blue square towards the left, um, plots in a chemical space that's not represented by meteorites, which is interesting. Although we see there's pretty large error ellipse on that sample. Um, the orthopyroxene uh, circles also plot a little bit higher in iron content than what we've observed in the Martian meteorites. And I don't have a good answer for why that is. Uh, it's also interesting that the chemin samples don't span all of the chemical space covered by Martian meteorites. It's also um, important to note that pyroxenes are some of the hardest phases to refine from an XRD pattern of a multi-mineral sample. So we have a really hard time um, nailing down what these are. And, and, and so as a result, their unit cell parameters, which is what this you know, calculation is based on, have much larger errors than the other phases. So our confidence in, in our ability to predict these unit cell parameters is lower. Um, the algorithm can predict very well, but you know, if we have high error on, on our unit cell parameters, you know, there's only so much information we can get out of that. However, um, we may not have a ton of confidence in these predictions and we may have big error bars, but I generally think that um, having some idea of the composition is better than having no idea of the composition. So I still like to calculate these. And um, la the last system I'd like to mention um, is also very complicated, but for different reasons. So that is the spinel oxides. These are things like magnetite and chromite that all of you are familiar with. Um, the reason the system is complicated is because the spinel structure can accommodate more than a dozen different chemical elements, and it's cubic, which means that it only has one unit cell parameter, and that's the A cell edge. Um, so the messy chart you see here is a result of that very complicated chemical space. Um, on the x-axis, we have the A unit cell parameter, and on the y-axis, we have iron content in atoms per formula unit, um, as I mentioned earlier. So that's from zero to three. If you, if you notice this chemical formula up here, this is the general formula. So our cation three and four oxygen. So we're going from zero to three atoms per form of the unit. So then each of these trends represent iron content as a function of the A cell edge in various chemical systems. So for instance, the green line is the trend of substituting titanium uh, for iron. And this is a, substitu a substitution that's commonly seen in Martian meteorites and is hypothesized um, by the mer emissions to be present uh, on the Martian surface. So um, 
of course, this results, I, I kind of said no more math. So we're just going to look at it and then it's going to go away. Um, those are the equations. <laughs> if you're interested in that, those are the equations that make the graph that you see here, those two and three component systems. But I won't, I won't hit you with any more math. Um, so uh, this is, so I, it's much more complicated actually than what I'm showing you here. Um, it's not really accurate to limit the chemistry of our of our magnetite of our spinel to two or three component systems. Um, it can be nice to give us a general idea, which is what we use it for, but there are many higher dimensional compositions that basically span all of this space. Um, so we can look, but we can do some things though, okay? We're not like completely flying blind here. Um, so we can look at the range of, of the, what we see in Gale Crater. So that's the, that's the blue uh, bar you see there. And we know that we must exist somewhere within this chemical space. So that leaves us a lot of options, um, but it does rule out some. So for instance, we know that we don't have appreciable titanium, which as I mentioned, is commonly found in Martian meteorites and is hypothesized to be on the surface. So that's a pretty interesting finding. Um, you know, why are we not observing that in Gale Crater when, when we've clearly observed it other places? So, um, but we don't have to rely strictly on, on these relationships. Of course, I decided to take a look at the bulk sample compositions um, and, and some potentially likely formational environments. So um, if we limit ourselves to those um, two and three component systems, First, we have a chromium rich magnetite. Um, that is a common accessory phase in basalt and it's often found in Martian meteorites. But in our case, we didn't see high amounts of chromium in the bulk sample composition. And an additional component of the Kemen instrument is we actually can do XRF as well, X-ray fluorescence, which can give us compositional information. So there were, uh, there were a few frames where we were able to isolate those individual magnetite grains and look at um, their corresponding XRF patterns and found that they were not chromium chromium rich. Um, so next we can think about um, uh, magnesium substitution. Uh, so that's unlikely um, simply because it forms in a rare geologic setting and it doesn't occur in abundances that we're seeing in Gale Crater. So it could be a minor component, um, but that, probably not a lot. Um, next, let's look at aluminum. So aluminum substitution is commonly found in mafic rocks, and we can't rule it out with bulk chemistry. So that's a that's a pretty likely one. Um, and lastly, cation deficient magnetite forms as a result of digenetic oxidation of olivine and is also therefore clearly a very likely candidate. We know that we have olivine that's being uh, altered away. So it seems pretty likely that that is also here as well. But the fact is we likely have some combination of, of the two and some additional chemical components mixed in. Um, so here are the Gale Crater averages for the three most likely compositions. Um, and you can see that all of these possibilities have pretty high iron content. So while we can't, you know, really 100% nail it down, we can get pretty close. Uh, you know, that still gives you quite a bit of information. So I mentioned this X-ray amorphous component earlier. Um, what about its composition? So we cannot directly measure it uh, through chemical means or X-ray diffraction, but that doesn't mean we can't determine anything about it. There is another instrument on board the rover that's called um, APXS. It's an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer, um, and it measures the bulk or whole rock uh, chemistry of a sample. So with this, we know the overall composition of a rock or sediment sample that we've analyzed in Gale Crater. And with the crystal chemical calculations that I just showed you a few moments ago, we can actually sum all of the crystalline phase compositions together and we know what is the bulk crystalline composition. So we can subtract that bulk crystalline composition from the whole rock composition and what's left over gives us the composition of the X-ray amorphous component. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into to those results here for the sake of time, but I just wanted you to know that we can use these data to get at that bulk amorphous composition, which can give us a little bit of information. So if you'd like to learn more about those results, you can check uh, out an upcoming paper led by my uh, colleague, Cherie Ackles. She uh, has worked extensively on this. It's a frustrating one, you should ask her. Um, so uh, I've thrown a lot of information at you and I'd like to show you this cool, super cool picture and just step back a bit and, and synthesize this. So <clears throat> the rocks and minerals that we've observed in Gale Crater tell us that there have been various stages of mineralization, environmental evolution and cycling throughout its history. These stages include extensive volcanism, which we know from the basaltic minerals I mentioned, like olivine, phagoclase, and pyroxene, and of course, the many volcanoes uh, dotting the surface of Mars. Uh, there's also 
also been a significant weathering and alteration by wind and fluids, which is clear from the sand dunes and windblown sedimentary structures, as well as the sedimentary structures formed uh, by moving and standing water. And of course, we've observed uh, minerals associated with alteration by water like clays and jarosite. We also have um, evidence of large long-standing bodies of fresh water that went through wet and dry periods causing evaporation and the deposition of evaporated minerals. So the nature and distribution of these rocks and minerals give unambiguous evidence for a dynamic hydrosphere, which is a critical component of uh, planetary habitability. So we already know that the necessary chemical elements are present. We've known, uh, we've now definitively confirmed through X-ray diffraction that there was longstanding water regime on Mars. And we've also discovered that there was significant geologic cycling. And these are all components needed for a habitable environment. So there you go. Um, and now moving on um, from the mission, I've really in the past years, I have, uh, my work has really trend, really as a result of the work that I did on Mars, my, my, uh, my research has really trended in this data driven data science direction. So I'm, I'm very keen on using machine learning and data science uh, on the wealth of information that we have in mineralogy. So I just wanted to give you guys, it's not really what this talk is about. I could have talked about that all night, but I just wanted to give you guys um, a little bit of a taste of some of the things that I'm doing in data science that particularly pertain to Mars. So I'm just going to mention a couple of projects there. Um, yeah, and you know, it was funny, I started out uh, really working in a lab, you know, I was doing, I was really lab based, I, I really hated the math, um, I think, as many people do. And it's, it's funny how, um, how the directions change, you know, and how your interests change. Um, I got very into expanding the the instrument capabilities um, of of the the Kemen instrument, um, but that kind of pushed me into expanding the capabilities of our data. Um, you know, we have we have what we have, and let's use it. And so that's kind of um, really been driving my new research directions. Um, so the first project I'd like to mention uh, is very related to the crystal chemical algorithms I described earlier, uh, which were largely based on, on least squares regression. Um, you probably noticed, uh, and I mentioned it several times, that I limited the chemical composition to two or three elements. So iron and magnesium in the case of olivine, um, you know, sodium and calcium in the case of plagioclase, iron, magnesium, calcium in the case of pyroxene. But the fact is minerals are almost never this pure in nature, right? That just doesn't happen. And the minor and trace elements they incorporate provide a huge amount of information about their formational environment. So they're critical to answering the questions that we're asking on Mars. Um, so I wanted to see if we could use machine learning to push the capabilities of Kemen and a spacecraft XRD in general um, even farther and ask the question, can we predict multi-element mineral compositions based on XRD data alone? The short answer is yes, we can. Um, in the case of olivine, I think I've got it up to, it's like 10 or 12 different elements I can predict at once. Um, so while I can't get down to trace element com concentrations, essentially I need concentrations high enough that you actually see a change in the unit cell parameters, but that's about point, depending upon the mineral um, and depending upon the element, that's uh, can be as low as 0.01 weight percent, which is microprobe level accuracy. Um, we can we can measure those those minor elements down to essentially yeah about the 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 precision of a microprobe, which is pretty exciting. Um, so this is immediately applicable to the minerals observed in Gale Crater, of course, uh, and it'll give us a better picture of the geologic history of the Martian surface. Um, and while it's not going to replace high precision chemical analyses on Earth, um, it can allow for quick assessment of major and minor, minor chemistry in, in a laboratory or even a field setting. They have field instruments that, that do XRD. Actually, Chemin instrument is sold um, by Olympus. You can actually buy that instrument. So if any of you are doing field XRD, you can buy it and you can use these techniques if you want to predict composition in the field. Um, but for me, the most exciting thing is that this method could be very useful for future planetary missions in which similar XRD technology is employed. Essentially, we've expanded the capability of XRD such that it's now equivalent to miniaturizing a massive microprobe and sending it to another planet. So this will give us a level of understanding of a planet's geologic history that is beyond what any other type of instrument um, can come close to. So I'm really, really excited about that. Um, uh, the next project I'd like to mention um, 
I understand that we have a lot of, of folks uh, who have kind of an, an interest in, in resources and economic geology. So this is very relevant to you too. Um, and that is mineral association analysis. Uh, so there are, as I've already mentioned, there are a lot of different applications um, and questions that it can address, uh, particularly pertaining to Mars. Uh, we can use this machine learning tool coupled with our vast mineralogical data to, um, uh, to uh, predict the location of Mars analogs on Earth's surface. So association analysis is a recommender system, so this is a type of machine learning, um, that characterizes multi-dimensional co-occurrence relationships and creates probabilistic models for future or currently unknown co-occurrences. So most of you have encountered these types of algorithms with uh, Amazon and Netflix. You see them all the time. Um, they use the purchase history of all of their users to predict what you might want to buy or watch um, based on just a few selections. And just like them, we can apply this to mineral systems because we also have a huge database of mineral co-occurrence on Earth's surface. We, we know this information and, and other planetary bodies. Um, so we can look at these multi-mineral correlations and give probabilities of where else we expect to find a given mineral, a mineral assemblage, or a geologic environment on Earth or another planetary body. So we can take a mineral assemblage that characterizes an environment on Mars, and we can query our association rules to ask questions like, where can I find a Mars analog environment on Earth that we didn't know existed? And to be clear, we're not simply looking for a place that is known to host the mineral assemblage in question. We can do that. We, we already do do that um, easily just by querying MinDAT or the Mineral Evolution Database. Um, but we are looking at uh, sites that are not known to host all of the mineral phases, but have a high likelihood of hosting them. And um, it's it's just that no one has reported that those phases are there yet. So we're looking at um, the complex correlations and anti-correlations of mineral occurrence to make predictions about the probability of that location being an analog site. We can also ask questions about uh, where we can find a single mineral of interest. So this is very useful from, for economic geologists, very useful for collectors. Um, and if we have a particular site we're interested in, we can actually determine um, what other phases are uh, most likely to occur at that location that we haven't found yet. So if you have a, a particular, uh, you know, mineral collection site that you like, um, you can actually protect what that mineral inventory there should be. So, um, and in fact, uh, with the MINDAT founder uh, and manager, Jolly and Ralph, we have implemented a very basic um, pairwise version of this algorithm on his website, MINDAT. Mindat and uh, we were able to predict a new location for the mineral wolfenite. We saw some pictures of that uh, earlier when we were getting started. And uh, one of the mineral collectors associated with MINDAT actually went out there uh, and confirmed that it did indeed uh, occur at that locality. So, we know even a pairwise, which is a very pared down version of this algorithm can work and we've ground truthed it. So, so far we're having really great results with our multi-correlation algorithm. And this is a really exciting new method and we hope to submit this paper in the next month or so, but you know how that goes. There's always so many things. <laughs> um, so the last project I'd like to briefly mention, um, I could have talked about this entire time. Um, and that is the evolutionary system of mineralogy that I'm working in. Uh, closely on with my uh, colleague, uh, my Carnegie colleague, Bob Hazen, which combines a mineral evolution, network analysis, and natural kind clustering. So this work harnesses the fact that minerals are incredibly information rich. You know, I've kind of harped on that throughout um, this whole talk, but this really brings it together. I mean, they offer the opportunity to integrate their characteristics and parameters. So these are things like minor and trace elements, isotopic ratios, structural defects, inclusions, textures, morphologies, you know, keep going. Um, and with that, we can gain a multidimensional, holistic mineralogical perspective of the dynamic um, materials and processes that have existed through deep time. So in building this system, we're able to characterize minerals by their formational environment and place them in their evolutionary context through deep time. So that allows us to ask questions like, how do we determine the formational environment of a mineral sample and whether or not there was any biogenic input into that origin, which is what I'm particularly interested in. So for some minerals, this is straightforward and, and with morphology um, or first, first order major element chemistry, but for other, it's not so simple. So, so how are we doing this? Um, 
pyrite, for example, I've got some really cool pictures of pyrite up there. Um, it forms in many different environments and ways, some of which have biological input and some of which, most of which don't. Um, but if I tell you that I found a pyrite on Mars, what does that tell you about the Martian environment? Not a lot, right? Because it forms in so many different ways. It could be any one of these things. Um, so it's not very helpful for determining the geologic conditions and particularly whether or not there was any biological input into those environments. However, that information is locked within each mineral specimen. And in order to extract that information, we've utilized the robust databases of pyrite geochemistry in combination with the natural kind clustering and type of machine learning um, in order to examine the multivariate correlations across the various um, major, minor, trace element and isotopic ratios. So with this work, we've been able to create a clustering classification workflow that can predict the formational environment of any pyrite specimen of unknown origin. And we are currently working to apply a similar workflow to other mineral systems. So um, we've developed a database of 1600 pre-solar silicon carbide grains. Um, that paper is out. You can check that out. That's Bougie Bar uh, et al. 2021. Um, we've also collected over 100,000 garnet analyses, 178,000 bone spar samples, and 3,500 chloride species. So all of that is in the works and it's, it's really exciting. I'm so excited about the work um, that we're going to be able to, to do with that. So all of this, um, you know, predicting um, biosignatures, predicting, you know, I can pick up a, a mineral, I have no idea where it came from, and I can say definitively what its formational environment was. Um, and we'll also be able to, with more sample return, we'll be able to gain a lot of information about you know, what truly were the environments um, that we had on Mars and was there any biogenic input? So um, with that, I'm, I'm going to thank everybody while I'm playing what was one of the coolest days of my life. So this is the Curiosity uh, rover launch um, in 2011. Um, definitely one of the coolest days of my life. You could feel the shockwave. Um, so you can find this video on YouTube. It's being very glitchy for me. I'm sorry about that. Um, but it's on YouTube. So uh, yeah, so I'd like to um, thank, of course, everyone for inviting me. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I hope that, that I gave you some, some fun things to think about um, and at least some nice pictures of Mars. And I'd also like to thank my many, many uh, collaborators and colleagues and, and the MSL team and uh, of course, NASA and my other funders. And with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. <laughs>